Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Janati Stolier of the Second. I am very pleased to be with you today. I am the chairman of the U.S. Transhumanist Party and the chief executive of the Nevada Transhumanist Party. And today with me, uh, I have a guest uh, with whom I'm conducting an interview for the Movement for Indefinite Life Extension or MILE. My guest is named Ira Pastor. Uh, he is the CEO of BioQuark Incorporated. And Mr. Pastor has 30 years of experience across multiple sectors in the pharmaceutical industry, including pharmaceutical commercialization. He also has experience in biotech drug development, managed care, distribution, OTC, and retail. He served as Vice President of Business Development for drug development company Phytomedics Incorporated, raising $40 million of private equity, consummating over $50 million of licensing deals, and bringing lead drug candidates from discovery stage to phase three, uh, phase three development. Prior to that, employed by SmithKline Beecham Pharmaceuticals, working in sales, marketing, and business strategy positions. Mr. Pastor has also served as Vice President of Corporate Development for the pharmacy benefit management company Prescription Delivery Services, which was acquired by Cigna Health Insurance. He has an MBA from Temple University, a Bachelor's of Science in Pharmacy from Rutgers University. Uh, he is also a board member of Regenerage, SAPI DeCV, a clinical company focused on expedited translational therapeutic applications of regenerative and rejuvenative healthcare interventions. He is also uh, a leader of the Reanima Project mm -hmm. and a member of the Executive Council of the World Academy of Medical Sciences. So it's a great honor to have you with us today, Ira. And my first question for you is, could you please tell us about some regeneration and repair mechanisms in non-human animals? Absolutely, and it's uh, and thanks so much for having me here today. Um, yes, I mean we uh, have spent the last several years uh, studying the dynamics of regeneration and repair in non-human species, and uh, you have uh, basically uh, a fascinating array of capabilities. Uh, in in lower organisms, um, many people in your audience are probably quite familiar with the ability of uh, members of the amphibian uh, kingdom to uh, regenerate uh, significant parts of their uh, spinal cord following uh, a, a major lesion or injury. Uh, this also uh, occurs in terms of their uh, limbs. Uh, many of these organisms uh, also have the same regenerative capacity in, in their critical organs, so heart, kidney, liver, uh, eyeball, uh, major parts of their brain. But the fascinating thing is uh, basically how they do it, because of the major forms of regeneration that exist in nature that humans possess, namely physiological turnover, uh, hypertrophic regeneration, and wound healing, which basically, uh, for lack of a better word, are a, uh, a bottom-up form of regeneration where uh, form may be recapitulated, but function is not always gained. What you see in lower organisms is the recapitulation of both form and function, basically a reinitiation, let's say, of the development process again. And, you know, this is something that um, from an evolutionary perspective, um, died out uh, a few hundred million years ago. Uh, many of the evolutionary biology uh, world will tell you it has, due to the fact that uh, we as humans uh, and uh, you know mammals and so forth, uh, due to the fact that we bleed very rapidly and we die of loss of blood very rapidly, uh, could not afford uh, that payoff anymore. And uh, as a result, uh, the human system ultimately was much more biased towards wound healing and scar formation uh, and the preservation of life uh, in, in that context. But what we're in essence looking to do is really study these dynamics in more detail. And they are very complex dynamics. It's, uh, it's much more 
uh, sophisticated uh, a process in nature of, in terms of epimorphic regeneration than, uh, for instance, just uh, replacing some cells. Um, but really understanding these biological dynamics and ultimately crafting new products, biologics, uh, to recapitulate them in humans and, and restart these capabilities uh, creatively um, in the human system uh, for both purposes of cellular repair but also cellular regeneration. So basically addressing a wide range of sort of therapeutic opportunities that, that spin off of that. That's very interesting. And it is fascinating to me that there are creatures who evolve the, these regenerative capacities a lot earlier than the human species even evolved. And we may be the most sophisticated life form on the planet, at least from an intellectual standpoint, and yet we lack some of these uh, regeneration abilities. So my question for you, you mentioned there's this, uh, let's say, tendency toward uh, healing wounds very quickly because humans uh, bleed a lot. Uh, can you expand uh, upon that a bit more and also on what some of the other obstacles in humans and other complex mammals would be to these regenerative capacities existing naturally? Yeah, I, mean, I think that uh, that is a major one. I think uh, the balance that we must maintain as a mammal, uh, and the fact that uh, beyond just uh, surface wounding, anything uh, of a substantial uh, impact, which leads to uh, the rapid loss of blood, uh, has to be controlled. And uh, it's the case in many lower organisms that they do not possess that uh, rapid bleeding. Uh, you see the capability still genetically or epigenetically to initiate this, uh, let's say, more passive form of uh, healing and regeneration. Um, now, that's not to say that we, we don't maintain some of it. I mean, we do, um, as mentioned, we do have uh, a very nice physiological uh, regeneration capability in terms of uh, rapidly uh, turning over tissues in terms of epithelial layer of skin uh, and our blood and of course our hair and nails. We have this uh, hypertrophic uh, ability in uh, the, the human liver and of course our, our wound healing response. Now you know one of the tricks here because obviously regenerative biology uh, and the study of this entire area of epimorphic regeneration has gone on for decades. Uh, you know, the heyday was, you know, uh, I, I point to a period between the 1940s and the 1970s when uh, you know, tens of thousands of papers were published on these particular dynamics. But one of the issues, you know, as we stepped into more of the molecular biology era, uh, and, you know, the initial thought that, hey, well, there might be some uh, genes that are involved here that we can just uh, turn on and, 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 and reignite these processes. Well, uh, you unfortunately run into brick walls there because uh, due to conservation amongst the genomes uh, of us and many of these other organisms, we possess all those genes. Uh, the problem comes that the fact that uh, they're related to proliferation of cells uh, and growth and you know unfortunately uh, just turning them on uh, uncontrollably sort of in a genetic engineering context isn't going to get you that far uh, because uh, uncontrolled proliferation uh, at the genetic level is a, is a path towards uh, uncontrolled cell growth and oncogenesis so that's not the direction that we're going we took a uh, a slightly different strategic perspective and saying, okay, the issues don't have to do with more uh, numbers or copies of the genes, but in essence, how they are controlled differently with the regulatory architecture of the genome. So the higher level control mechanisms that we see at play in the gene regulatory networks, the cellular regulatory networks, 
and sort of the nested hierarchies that exist above the genome and how we can creatively, when again, going back to nature and studying the proteins and the microRNAs and, and the various other factors that are at play, uh, how we can bring sort of a, a holistic approach to targeting this type of regeneration in humans. It is not, and you know, once again, I, I spent enough time in the pharmaceutical industry, which is the place that loves sort of single magic bullet answers to things. Uh, this is not an area where the single magic bullet will ever work because there's just so much going on. So we really have to think creatively of what our bioproduct or a drug is going to look like at the end because it is going to be uh, complex and what we'll, we term combinatorial in nature, having to address many targets simultaneously as opposed to just uh, a single uh, drug compound or a single gene. So in terms of uh, the compound you're thinking of and how it will be applied ultimately if everything goes well, uh, will it be taken in the form of a pill or will it be some other type of treatment or series of treatments that you have in mind? We are primarily looking at uh, proteins uh, and peptides and microRNAs uh, that are involved in the uh, epimorphic regenerative cascade, uh, some of which are responsible for the underlying cellular reprogramming process in epimorphosis, some of which are responsible for a targeted histolytic event, so the ability to clear away uh, dead tissue and uh, degraded extracellular matrix. Uh, there's a, and then there's another part of the, the puzzle which has been extensively reported on uh, over the last several years, and that is uh, how the lower organisms in the animal kingdom utilize their innate immune response as part of the regenerative mechanisms. And there's been some wonderful studies recently just showing how you shut down the innate immune response in a, in a salamander or a planarian or, you know, one of these organisms that's so great at regenerating, they don't regenerate anymore. So, you know, we think of in humans, the innate immune response as being solely related to sort of allergic events. But, you know, at a low level, these species wield it. Uh, as part of the uh, regenerative dynamic that occurs following that, what we'll say, that insult uh, to their tissue. So um, there's a lot going on, and we are basically, you know, creating and we call biologics that have more than one bioactive moiety within them. And specifically, we spent a lot of time studying the biologic moieties that are found in ooplasms, so the cytoplasm of A, um, primarily because this is the one area in humans uh, where we see the sort of the combined capabilities of uh, reprogramming and remodeling uh, occurring. I mean, it only in humans only occurs in this very brief window of time following the formation of the early embryo. Uh, this is the only time in uh, the human experience where uh, age is reset, uh, where the genome and the epigenome are cleaned up, and the uh, new embryo is prepared uh, with a full sort of biologic regulatory suite of capabilities to move forward in its transition to embryogenesis and morphogenesis. So we are studying those bioactive moieties and comparing them and spending a lot of time analyzing them versus what is found in the, for instance, the regenerating limb uh, of uh, a salamander as an example. And, and, and studying in really in detail what, uh, what is required for this full sort of capture of this, this, these biologic events and how we can ultimately then apply them either parenterally or potentially orally or topically in terms of skincare applications uh, in humans. And you know, that's what we spent a lot of time uh, working on the last few years. Yes, so it seems like you're still uh, investigating various delivery mechanisms uh, for uh, these kinds of treatments. Is that an accurate description? Yeah, and, and we have 
uh, you know, drug delivery uh, and drug administration is a is a science all unto itself, and um, you know we are we're taking clues from the experts uh, that have been there in the past. And um, but the the good thing is that uh, strategically we are going along a line of development uh, where, in essence, regulators. Uh, whether that be the FDA or MA or what have you, have seen substances like this in the past. So, you know, we are not dealing with anything creatively new in the context of uh, anti-sense or uh, genetic engineering uh, and what have you, but really working with traditional technologies for biologics uh, development and production, but, uh, you know, the biologic at the end of the day is a little more complex than your, your insulin or your growth hormone or your interferon. Yes. And that's, I think a good bridge into the next area of questions I had in mind in terms of BioQuark's research and the products and treatments you're seeking to develop. Uh, could you tell us a bit about the regulatory system in the United States that applies to these and do you find it convenient to work with or do you see significant obstacles to achieving your goals in the status quo? No, I th we're fairly comfortable with our pathway in the United States in the sense that uh, what, you know, what we have in the vial at the end of the day is in essence a biologic as described uh, by both FDA and uh, EMEA and so forth. So basically you have a, uh, an existing definition, a protein or a carbohydrate or a protein carbohydrate combination uh, that is derived from a living cell system uh, where its characterization is uh, much more based on its production system versus its physiochemical characteristics. Um, pretty straightforward stuff. Uh, on top of that, because we are dealing with heterogenic bioproducts, um, which make production a little more complex, but give us a lot more intellectual uh, protection on the back end, this is also something that FDA uh, has seen in the past, uh, and they know sort of how to regulate in the sense that uh, there are several fairly well-known products uh, on the U.S. drug market today, which are not new chemical entities, but are mixtures of entities. So FDA has seen uh, both historically and in recent regulatory niches, uh, the, uh, the new drug ingredients or NDIs that are mixtures of bioactive substances. So they know how to look at those as well. I mean, the issue like anything is that the, the U.S. FDA uh, process is, uh, is long and expensive no matter what you do. Um, even if you're going after an orphan indication or fast tracking, uh, you still have a lot of work and a lot of money to raise. So we as a company uh, have a multi-focus focus strategy. Uh, we are a East Coast-based uh, drug development shop doing drug development 101 here in the United States. Um, and that is one component of our business. Uh, we also, uh, due to the fact that we are working with you know, if in the context of uh, natural product-based raw materials, there are other non-prescription opportunities for us in terms of uh, consumer packaged goods and uh, dermatological products where obviously your claims uh, to change because you cannot make drug claims in the United States uh, on, on non-drug products, but there are some unique uh, business opportunities there for us as well in the United States. Now, taking a step back for a moment, um, while we are a U.S.-based company, uh, we are under no illusion that there are 200 other countries out there that have uh, different uh, regulatory systems. And, uh, of course, uh, it, it's the smart people in this industry will tell you that as much as the United States means to the total drug spend around the world, that there's dozens of other countries coming online uh, in the developing world that are going to be a much bigger piece of that pie 10 to 20 years out. Uh, 
So we need to look at those countries as well, because everything that is a drug in the United States uh, is not always the drug in, uh, in Germany or Thailand or Turkey or China. So uh, we have to look at these opportunities as well, and whether you call them uh, uh, medical tourism or uh, regulatory arbitrage, uh, we are seeing uh, an extensive sort of development in this space beyond the uh, sort of the typical uh, services that that industry has employed in the past towards more sort of compassionate use uh, experimental options. And there was, you know, a wonderful example recently, uh, a couple months ago, where uh, Merck, you know, one of the world's largest drug companies uh, for, for their, one of their main uh, cancer antibodies, uh, got uh, approval in mainland China, but then compassionate use approval on an island off the coast of China designated by the Chinese government uh, for compassionate care opportunities for the same product. So we think that things are definitely changing around the world, and it's not a matter of the old model anymore of, you know, raise a, a couple hundred million dollars and develop your drug here in the United States first and then worry about the rest of the world because the rest of the world is coming online uh, both with uh, the, the, the purchasing capabilities but also the unique regulatory models. So you cannot just you know, put your head in the sand and, and think you know, you're only a U.S. company anymore. You have to, you have to think rather broadly for how this uh, regenerative medicine, uh, anti-aging, whatever you want to call it on the, on the grand scale of things gets done. Yes, and it's interesting that progress in the rest of the world where the uh, testing and approval process might not be as expensive as it is in the United States might eventually catalyze progress in the United States with these advances trickling in perhaps and the safety of certain treatments once they've been tested elsewhere uh, being more recognized and achieving a greater comfort level with the U.S. regulatory authorities. Now, it's interesting that you mentioned uh, the term biologics as perhaps being subject to less FDA, uh, how shall I say, it, barriers than uh, perhaps other types of drugs, other types of treatments. Uh, and you said the FDA has a specific definition of uh, biologic. Uh, I wonder if you could elaborate on that and how a biologic would differ from other substances that the FDA would review as drugs. You know, I, I just make that point because biologics uh, in the existing definition go back to I mean, the 1920s, in essence, to you know, the development of insulin. Um, so I was more or less making a point that FDA knows what uh, a biologic is and sort of how to um, regulate it in, or how to regulate its development. Uh, when you bring something that is different uh, to sort of your small chemical entity or your biologic, um, there is, even though it's the FDA and it's a wonderful resource, there's a learning process there. And I'll give you an example. Um, about 10 years ago, I was involved in the development of uh, drugs once again, based on natural products. Uh, FDA had developed in 2004 a regular, regulatory path known as the botanical drug, which basically for the first time in the United States, and this is, you know, you can do this elsewhere, Germany, uh, China, some other uh, territories where they understood that a, for instance, an herbal extract um, did not always fit either as a drug or a dietary supplement, but somewhere in between. Um, and so FDA developed this new niche, they, they, they developed it back in 1996, but the final regs went through in 2004. And it was just one of those amazing things where some people got it, right? That, okay, there's this drug, it's an extract, it may have 500 chemicals in it uh, from some plant. Uh, we understand it has a biologic effect, but all right, now what do we do with regard to our traditional model of how we look at these things? I and mean, we typically like to look at pharmacokinetics. How do we study pharmacokinetics of 500 bioactive moieties? Um, you have, uh, you bring to the table, for instance, uh, history of human use in 
some other country where you have 2,000 uh, individuals that have used the product in, in large-scale clinical trials, how do we, what do we then do about the early rabbit and guinea pig models that we want you to do? So, you know, when you bring something that is non-conventional, uh, a lot more questions are asked, and it might take a lot longer, and that's why, not to say that uh, some of this more cutting-edge stuff isn't going to uh, get through ultimately, but there's just going to be uh, those intra-regulator hurdles uh, beyond your scientific development program uh, that are just going to take time, and, and, uh, and we think there's a major learning curve there, so that's, you know, once again, hence why we wanted to craft our own program around something that at least they have seen, uh, mm -hmm. and seen stuff they look, and they know basically how to, how to proceed with it. Um, from, a, from a regulatory angle. Yes, and it seems based on your comments, the primary obstacles to a more accelerated approval are time, money, and regulator comfort with awareness of the emerging treatments. And I wonder along those lines, what uh, political reforms or regulatory reforms would you favor to accelerate the ability of uh, your work at Bioport to bring major health benefits to the public? Well, I mean, it's, a, it's a great question and obviously there's been a lot uh, with uh, Mr. Trump's, uh, President Trump's uh, new potential FDA head uh, coming on board and a lot in the U.S. press about uh, pulling regs out from under uh, the system. Um, but without getting that drastic, I mean, I definitely think exploring something like what Japan has recently done with conditional approval of earlier stage clinical assets uh, makes a tremendous amount of sense in the fact that, uh, look, you have, you always have these studies where you have a a wonderful phase two study that uh, that blows an active comparator away, and then you have their phase three study which falls flat, and drug company X always just throws the product away. And and you know, it's not that the product didn't work; it's the fact that we sit here in 2017 and we really don't know anything, the next to nothing, despite what you might read about. We know very little regarding pharmacogenomic and more importantly, toxicogenomic differences uh, within heterogenic populations of people. So why something works in phase two and it fails in phase three, we really never know. And the point that I think you know, is very prescient and, and what I think is wonderful about the Japanese experience is they're willing to create uh, a modified system that says, okay, it makes sense. We have good phase two data. Let's get it out there and let's not waste any more time uh, for the people that really need it. And we're going to lose hundreds of thousands of people that are dying every year because of breast cancer, or pancreatic cancer, what have you, waiting for the phase three data. Let's get it in front of people that want it today, that could use it today, uh, and gather a much wider basket of experience, um, and ultimately um, generate what is much more representative of the total population of people that potentially would use the product as opposed to what you typically see in these registrational uh, drug designs where, you know, ultimately at the end of the day, every drug company knows the product is going to work in a very small percentage of the people that studied it in just because of the design of the studies. So I, I think something akin to, once again, what Japan has done with conditional approval uh, makes a lot of sense. Uh, whether there's the uh, political will for it here, I don't know. Uh, it seems to me that uh, Mr. Trump is moving more in that direction with regard to uh, things, but we'll, we'll have to wait and see uh, what happens. It's interesting. I had read about the Japanese reforms with regard to uh, giving conditional approval to drugs that had passed the phase one and phase two trials. And my understanding is those are predominantly focused on safety. And then once the drugs are uh, generally recognized as reasonably safe for consumers to purchase, consumers would have some choice whether or not those drugs ultimately prove to be efficacious, at least they get to try them, and if they happen to be efficacious, 
then uh, those patients will benefit, whereas in the current system, it might take 10 to 15 years uh, for a drug to get through all of the trials before it's even eligible to uh, be marketed to patients. So uh, I do think that would constitute major progress for accelerating the arrival of those treatments. Now, uh, I wanted to also ask you, uh, on BioQuark's website, uh, it is stated that the main product that BioQuark is currently researching, the main substance, is called BQA. And uh, I'd like you to talk a bit more about BQA and what studies has BioQuark conducted with it? Sure. So <clears throat> BQA is the is the current code for our lead agent the, that is a, uh, it represents a highly purified but uh, still combination or a mixture of certain proteins uh, found in ooplasm uh, that is being developed as our API, uh, our active pharmaceutical ingredient or active biologic ingredient. Um, it is uh, based, you know, the research program, once again, goes back uh, to the historical studies on bioactive moieties derived from this particular source of ooplasm uh, that go back to the 1950s in the original cloning experiments conducted uh, using the species uh, Xenopus lavis, which is a, uh, a species of uh, African frog. The uh, but the more interesting research, from our opinion, is what happened in the 1970s when the first studies on what were known as the egg-free reconstitution experiments were conducted, where basically for the first time, and this is what allowed the species to become so popular originally in the, in the pharmaceutical industry, uh, basically the ability to study uh, the act of biologic dynamics once the ooplasm and its constituents were separated from the egg. Basically, it had this very unique property of sort of maintaining life outside of the egg so that uh, people could study all sorts of molecular and developmental biology uh, in the petri dish. And that goes back to the 1970s. We wanted to sort of take the research to the next step and say, okay, there is a wonderful array thousands of, of bioactive moieties that have been studied uh, for the last few decades now uh, via this real, raw material source. We wanted to really drill down uh, and sort of extract sort of principal moieties that were responsible for the events that we're most interested in, namely the reprogramming and the remodeling uh, effect on somatic tissue. So ultimately, you know, think of this, you know, BQA as uh, any, uh, natural product derived biologic that's been on the market. So uh, you can go back to uh, porcine based insulin, calcium, uh, salmon, calcitonin, streptokinase, even into uh, today's modern world, uh, product like Botox, which is uh, once again, a, a very popular uh, biologic derived from a non-human source. We have been studying first couple of years, we spent a lot of time recapitulating the uh, previous sort of petri dish experience on the ability of these bioactive moieties to reprogram somatic cells in a petri dish to a stem cell-like state. But that is only one part of the sort of the, the, the rubber band. Uh, we need to capture the events moving back in the other direction, so for the remodeling of tissue. So that led to our work in a variety of disease and damage models, uh, and we've studied a bunch to date, uh, melanoma, traumatic brain injury, uh, various uh, skin care uh, models, and basically looking at this underlying dynamic which exists, where basically you have a, uh, a reprogramming event followed by a tissue remodeling event. And we've seen some very exciting things in both uh, regeneration in terms of uh, the central nervous system in the traumatic brain injury models, and also remodeling events in tumors. And now this is sort of a, a side story, but um, people always ask about you know, the oncology connection. And, you know, and one of the most fascinating things that, you know, once again, you have to jump into the literature and it's, it's kind of shocking how much medical history is forgotten. But in the development of biology era, the regenerative biology era, a lot of studies were done on the ability of these same species, the, the regenerators, and their ability to 
uh, revert to tumors. So basically, cancer is an extremely rare killer in species that have an effective regenerative mechanism. Why? Because the same way that these species are very good at reprogramming and retasking tissue into new tissues, they're very good at taking tumors and turning them into normal tissues as well. And it's one of these uh, fascinating things because you always see this sort of double-edged sword in the sort of regenerative medicine space with uncontrolled proliferation. But the truth is, those species that are great at regenerating are the hardest to kill with cancer because they just like to turn it into something else. So that is the reason why we are also looking at the oncology models. And, um, and that's been a very uh, fascinating piece as well to see real time reversion events. So taking your mind away from sort of the kill centric methodology uh, in oncology nowadays and thinking, well, let, why don't we go back to nature and really look at how the, the experts at getting rid of cancer do it. it has nothing to do with killing. It has to do with turning tissue into something else. So, you know, that's a lot of that has been the basis for our internal uh, program. Uh, we then took some time to work with, uh, as mentioned, uh, formulators uh, here in the United States in terms of the non-prescription uh, and non-RX components of our business, namely looking at uh, dermatological uh, formulations and skincare opportunities, uh, as well as the fact that, you know, there is a, a nutritional or sort of superfood component to the uh, potential range of products as well in the sense that uh, this raw material source in, uh, in sub-Saharan Africa uh, goes back a couple hundred years in ethnomedicinal sense. So uh, there are you know, a lot of documented evidence that the uh, source uh, has been used as a food supply in various indigenous peoples in, uh, in Africa, and there are some unique opportunities there for us as well. But from a, a straight drug development perspective, uh, we are at the stage where we are still raising money for implementing a, a now a translational program into humans in the United States. And that, that's interesting. Uh, you seem to be involved in a wide variety of areas, a wide variety of possible applications. Now, uh, I'm curious in terms of uh, the methods of your studies. It, you said that you've conducted some studies in somatic cells. Do you also use computer models, animal models, any human trials at this stage, or is it too early sure. for that? Oh yeah, no. We have we have quite a few uh, animal models that uh, we we uh, undertake in the lab currently, primarily rodent. Um, but yeah, so we have um, in in part of our uh, non-U.S. Uh, program, we have a bunch of licensees in various countries that have. Um, uh, working with us on first in human applications, both in terms of skin care, uh, in uh, in both for therapeutic and aesthetic medicine, uh, as well as some early first in human uh, exploratory work in uh, diseases of unmet medical need, primarily spinal cord injury and uh, and traumatic brain injury. I'm very interested in, in in the central nervous system. So yes, we are um, definitely getting our research footprint out there and working you know, within the context of the systems that we can work in. The U.S. program is as a defined program and that will take its time like anything else, uh, but at the same time we realize the need to uh, license our technology uh, in other territories where uh, regulatory uh, options are move, move faster and, uh, and we can gather the first human experience, uh, both from a you know, therapeutic perspective, but at the same time to create a portfolio of data that can ultimately help support the, the US program back home. Yes, that's very interesting. And uh, you've also touched on uh, potential implications for fighting cancer, which are uh, quite different from uh, currently common approaches of just uh, killing the cancerous cells after they've proliferated. So it seems like if, if you're successful, this could be uh, an immense market and could help a lot of people who are struggling with cancer today. Uh, I'm also curious with regard to potential gains in overall lifespans that your approach could achieve for humans, sure. and what is your estimated time frame for success in achieving such gains, provided that everything goes according to your plan? 
Well, the, we, we've conducted one study, and it was a mouse study, uh, started at six months of life, and it went through uh, the, the natural lifespan of the animals. And we saw, uh, and it really wasn't set up as a gerontological study per se, it was more of a long-term observational study looking for, for all sorts of things. Um, but we saw a 70% boost uh, in, in lifespan uh, versus the control group. And, you know, that, once again, while it wasn't our initial goal to you know, focus on life extension per se in that model, it did give us further clues to the fact that uh, just like we are experimenting with these concepts of you know, interkingdom signaling and semiochemical communication, uh, basically the ability of uh, signals, biochemical signals of one species to affect the genome of another, uh, the fact that uoplasm is the one place in humans where age is ever reset to zero uh, gave us a clue that there is something here, uh, something that uh, may be a little more encompassing than uh, traditional approaches to anti-aging. And not to say that typical approaches and the research that's going on right now, whether they be in uh, uh, calorie restriction or uh, metformin or rapamycin or any of that stuff is no good. I, you know, it's, all, it's all great research, but basically, once again, coming back to what nature teaches us and the dynamics that are typically involved in taking that aged genome and taking it from point B back to point A, um, we think we have a very interesting, let's just say, potential side effect on our hands. Uh, and the ability to, uh, in the context of retasking a cell, a cell within a tissue, uh, that has taken on a regulatory state. When we say regulatory state, we're talking about sort of the, the complete transcriptional state of that particular cell and tissue at that point in time and pushing it to a previous time uh, potentially could have uh, very interesting uh, outputs in not just the downstream diseases of age, old age. I know there's a lot of debate whether the diseases of old age and aging are the same thing. I'm not going to get into that whole thing, but um, whether you cannot only deal with the genomic outputs of aging, but also deal with the cellular regulatory state and nudge it back. Um, and as we know, once again, I, we love nature and we love studying nature. There's one organism on this planet, the immortal jellyfish, Tordopsis nutricula, that does this. Uh, it grows up, it lives its life and it decides later on, I want to be a kid again. And it just trans turns back transcriptional regulatory state of every one of its cells to a younger state. I think uh, this is the logical connection to that ability in humans. Uh, we're obviously not there yet because we're only at the very beginning of our own human experience. But I believe that that uh, is something that let's say, in a, in a full portfolio of opportunities and options to deal with the diseases of old age uh, may be very sort of beneficial and adjuvant to other approaches. Very interesting. And yes, the uh, Turritopsis nutriculo or Turritopsis dornii jellyfish has fascinated me for quite a few years. I was also curious to find out more about your mouse studies where you were able to achieve 70% life extension in the mice. I know that the record holder, uh, at least the winner of the uh, Methuselah Mouse Prize for Longevity is uh, Dr. Andre Bartke, who was able to uh, render his mice to live for almost five years. And I'm curious by comparison, how long the lifespans of your mice were? Um, they went out, uh, I have to look at the, the exact date. I think it went out to three and a half or something like that. I'll have to look at the, uh, go back to the data. The, um, you know, we have to keep in mind that that was a, um, there was not beyond sort of just traditional 
you know, daily dosing. There wasn't a lot of uh, dose escalation or uh, significant discipline that went into that particular regimen uh, beyond sort of uh, the the nature of what you know the context of what that was all about in terms of just sort of an observational study for for many things um, but ultimately we think that um, the ability to uh, see those effects in humans um, will be translational um, and we're fairly confident because of the uh, what we have seen in terms of the interkingdom translation of regenerative abilities that normally end well before mammalian systems and being able to translate those into mammalian models and ultimately humans on the therapeutic side, that there will be some very nice uh, connections and, and benefits uh, translatable here. Uh, and, and I just bring that up because, you know, we, when we talk about mice, obviously we have to admit that um, as in cancer, uh, for instance, we cure cancer thousands of times a year <laughs> in mice. Uh, and it's really, it's less about the, the, the experiment in mice as it is in the, the translational event uh, up into humans. And so, um, yeah, we could play around with mice some more, but ultimately, I think like anything in, uh, in this space, uh, the goal is, is proof of principle in humans. Yes, well, as I'd like to say, the moment even one human being lives to age 130, pretty much everybody is going to be paying attention to that right. and the possibilities it entails. So I am curious also, in some of your previous interviews, you mentioned animals that could essentially reanimate after death or what would be death, the analog of death for us. And I wanted also to ask you how that ties into the Reanima project and its goals. Sure, sure. So yeah, I mean, the, there, there's only one organism on Earth that is known to die and reanimate, and that's uh, uh, Deinococcus radiodurans, uh, which has this fabulous ability to live in nuclear waste and and have its genome shattered only to reassemble um we're talking a, a, a little higher up the the evolutionary uh, ladder you run into species um like planarians uh like certain amphibians whose uh, you know brains uh for could pretty much be blown apart uh only to reform uh, via epimorphic processes some which whose brains can be removed entirely and grow back. Uh, and this was, you know, one of the, the cornerstones behind, uh, you know, our thinking about the Reanima project. Maybe it goes back a little more than that. We, uh, the, the natural world and it's uh, the animals within it and their ability to lose and thus regenerate uh, not just brain tissue, but memories in brain tissue has always been a fascinating area for us. Um, combined with sort of the uh, recent high profile cases in the United States um, in terms of that have sort of brought the topic of brain death to the public fore, namely those of uh, Jahai McMath and probably Christina Brown, really got us thinking along this line because you have this um, a rather wide area of the so-called disorders of consciousness, of which brain death or irreversible coma is at one end of a spectrum, um, that in essence, nothing in terms of, you know, we talk about funding of some of these conditions, really no money ever goes to it, uh, let alone you know, persistent vegetative state or coma. And, you know, thinking, okay, here we have wonderful evidence from nature of central nervous higher central nervous system regeneration uh, you have a evolving set of technologies in the regenerative medicine space and you have this third area which is a little less well known but which has gone on in the united states and many other countries for decades now which is the area of living cadaver research or the ability to study 
uh, the recently deceased. Uh, and basically bringing those three factors together, which led into the idea for the Reanima project, which was basically how we can use an existing uh, research model that is completely legitimate and ethical and, and legal uh, to not study, for instance, high dose therapy that would normally kill somebody, but instead begin to study the dynamics of neuroregeneration uh, in the, the ideal model, which is the human. And so that was sort of the basis behind uh, the idea for that project. Now, the fourth component of it is, in essence, we spent a lot of time studying traumatic brain injury uh, and traumatic brain injury models and central nervous system regeneration in, in in lower mammals, um, and really wanted to put the put these dynamics together um, into a platform that not necessarily is going to uh, bring life back to the dead tomorrow, but definitely has a defined target because you know we we talk about this 150,000 people we lose every day and 100,000 of them with aging. Well, there's 50,000 every day that don't die of aging, and whether you die of aging or whether you die of uh, some sort of traumatic injury, you all pass through this final disease state at the end of the day, which is the death of the brain. Uh, and we felt it was a fertile ground to work on, and hence why we designed uh, that particular project. Um, it is a moonshot of ours. It's uh, definitely uh, not in our core portfolio, but we believe the trickle-down effects on all forms of central nervous system regeneration, whether that's for chronic degenerative diseases or whether it's for acute damage, um, is, is completely translatable. And I certainly wish you all the best of success with that project. It could have some uh, very interesting ethical and political implications. For instance, if a person is brain dead or in a persistent vegetative state and is hooked up to life support, and some people want to keep that person on life support, other people want to cut off the life support. Now, with work like that of the Reanima Project, if it succeeds, a legitimate argument could be made that that person might perhaps be brought back. So uh, perhaps it wouldn't uh, anymore just be a matter of that person needing the support indefinitely. So that's very interesting. Uh, now, I was also curious, of course, there are some life extensionists who uh, don't believe that the technology for rejuvenation will come in time for them. So they have uh, designated essentially that they would be cryopreserved after uh, their legal deaths. Uh, is the work of the Reanima project going to potentially have applications for them perhaps several decades down the road? Um, I guess that question is more for the uh, cryopreservation technology community and how that particular component of the cryonics story evolves because and I'm not by no means an expert in, in that because right now the the goal at least on reanimus side is is working with you know like sort of fresh it's fresh tissue um, and uh, basically, you know, the, the current def under the current living cadaver research definition, so beating heart, breathing, and, and certain nutrient and, and trophic support. Um, what happens um, in a future of a, and I apologize for the crude, a defying event, um, and, and what is there to work with, I, I can't say at this point. What we, what we do like to say is that we think that while the cryonics model is about uh, somebody smart 500 years figuring something out, I think that it is equally important to, uh, to work on this problem today with the tools we have today because we might find out, hey, we, we, succeed, uh, we succeed next year. Uh, you don't need really you don't need cryonics anymore. What you need is something else. You need something in between cryonics and intensive care, um, whereby you, you know, sort of a way station for neuroreanimation, and and you will not have to go as far as um, uh, the deep the deep freeze. Uh, but you know that 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 will we'll see when the time comes. Yes. So perhaps a 
near term hope would be say for an auto accident victim or the victim of another kind of accident who has recently died to essentially be brought back to life after some serious repair of uh, the tissues and organs of the body. Right, right. That, that's, that's exactly it. So somebody in the, and although there's argument within the neurointensive community whether it is truly a gray zone, there are some pretty smart people out there that say yes, there's, there is something between coma and irreversible coma and that cannot be ignored because there's a few dozen cases in the literature over the last 30 years uh, of so-called brain death reversal none of which ever had a positive outcome and they're primarily in very in very young but nonetheless the fact that their reported dynamics say that there is something um, unique going on there is a gray zone there and it's not always completely absolute in, in this curtain definition per the harvard criteria the you know we make a point look we're that's the, that's where the reanima project is meant to focus today uh you know no brain death as a um, an incurable chronic disease uh no catastrophic brain death that you may find in a a war zone, uh, no time sensitive brain death, uh, such as a, a murder victim that doesn't get found for five days. And, and lastly, just, you know, obviously there's a, <laughs> been a lot of, we're not working with corpses and it, we don't do anything beyond the, the living cadaver definition of basically the intensive care patient. So, but um, even though that means we will not be, uh, reanimus succeeding next year doesn't mean you've solved uh, death. Uh, entirely, you have you would have made substantial <laughs> progress towards now looking at all these other instances and and really uh, at some point in the in the future dealing with these harder forms of death uh, that that are that confront us every day. Yes, and well, any progress in this area would be wonderful in my view. Now, I also wanted to ask you because MILE, the movement for indefinite life extension, is aimed at building awareness of and support for research in biotechnology, medicine, life extension. Uh, how important would you say it is to hasten the buildup of awareness for a work like yours? And would it help, for instance, if five million people tomorrow became aware of your research and we're considering the importance of treatments that could uh, reverse aging or beat back certain diseases absolutely it's it, it would be invaluable the you know the one thing i always point out you know having grown up and spent most of my time in, in the drug industry is you know, people are are well aware of the uh the sums of money that we spend, uh, we, and I say that globally, you know, we spend seven trillion dollars nowadays um, around the world on healthcare. We spend a trillion on drugs, 200 billion on medical devices, a couple hundred billion more on new R&D. They see these incredible numbers, but I don't think they ever really drill down to, um, you know, what are the possibilities? They just see the numbers and, uh, well, hey, but there should be begin to realize, you know, where's my cure for Alzheimer's? Where's my cure for breast cancer? Where's my cure for diabetes? And they're just not there today. And so I think uh, there needs to be a, a better understanding, better education of sort of what the status quo is, what we're spending the money on, where we could better spend it. Uh, and whether that be on research, whether that be on regs, uh, what have you. I think the and what you're doing in terms of awareness and, and really moving the conversation to this concept that most people might think of science fiction or even beyond science fiction today, but understand that there's a lot of people working on this problem and it, it might be a lot sooner than they think if the right resources could be mobilized and if the right regulatory infrastructure could be set up around it. So it's yes. wonderful. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And for those of us who want to help in terms of accelerating these advances, uh, what recommendations would you have in terms of ways to get involved, uh, what to look for, what to study, 
and how to communicate with the general public? Um, you know, from a from a, a study perspective, I, I'm a strong proponent of um, studying medical history and studying not just the uh, individual technologies, but the the interaction between areas that that might rarely talk. I mean, as I said, we spend as you know a lot of time on the non-human world. You think, well, non-human world. That's but people forget that the majority of that trillion dollars we spend anywhere around the world on drugs comes from natural products in the natural world. But we sort of forget about these things. So spend a lot of time looking at a diverse range of disciplines that impacts uh, this area, not just, you know, the thing that's hot, not just the immunotherapy that's hot today or this gene engineering approach that's hot. Look broader than that. I think answers, just like we find our car keys between the pillows of our couch, answers are going to be found between disciplines by the interaction of disciplines. And the only other suggestion, you know, from a an investor perspective, I've always been a big proponent that, uh, you know, you see these these billionaires out there that spend a tremendous amount of money on on basic science, which is wonderful. But the real problem this industry has always had is not the basic science, but it's the translational sort of valley of death phase uh, and, and the amount of stuff that just gets lost to time uh, due to the fact that we sort of ignore those near-term translational opportunities and getting them through humans and out to people. Uh, and so this is a, another very important piece, not just looking at the core science, but looking at look at as many companies as you can, do research, find out who's doing what and, and how close they are to potentially uh, translational human opportunities as opposed to maybe just writing some more papers and putting them in the archives. Yes, well, thank you very much, Ira, for your excellent answers today. I think we covered a broad range of topics from uh, the emerging research that you and BioCork are delving into to uh, political and regulatory implications, to societal implications, to prospects for the future. I think our members and supporters of the Movement for Indefinite Life Extension are going to find this video to be an invaluable resource. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me here today. This was wonderful. It's great talking to you. Likewise.